Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first event of our 2014-15 season of the Provost Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. We're delighted to have as our lecturer today Michael Teitelbaum, Senior Research Associate in the Labor and Work-Life Program at the Harvard Law School. Those of you who are familiar with this lecture series know that its goal is to advance understanding and dialogue across campus and beyond on the many challenges currently facing public universities such as ours. Our guiding question is, what should and can the public university be in the 21st century? Professor Teitelbaum will receive a proper introduction in just a couple of minutes, so let me just say that his topic and the deep knowledge and expertise he brings to it wonderfully fulfills the aspirations of our lecture series. His topic, STEM, Immigration and Controversy, Does the U.S. Have Enough STEM Workers, is one all of us have heard quite a lot about in recent years. Unfortunately, the sum of what we've heard has left us with an incomplete and often contradictory understanding of our need for STEM workers. Our society cannot make wise decisions on this issue without the guidance of distinguished experts, such as Professor Teitelbaum. His presentation today is highly relevant, not only to our society, but to our universities, public and private, both. For U.S. universities are at ground zero with respect to this issue, having uh, been enlisted to significantly increase the number of STEM students they graduate in order to answer this apparent societal need. Obeying this imperative has had and will continue to have significant consequences for the curricula, research programs, and institutional character of all of our universities. In other words, universities have a very compelling reason to make sure that they have their STEM facts straight. And we look to Professor Teitelbaum to help us today with that critical task. Before I leave the subject of our program, let me remind you all that you're invited to continue the discussion during the reception in this location immediately following our audience question period. Now, a very quick look ahead. Today's Provost Forum will be followed by five more during this academic year. I hope you'll be able to join us for all or many of these. Details for all events are available on my website, and flyers will be forthcoming. So let me just tantalize you now with the knowledge that our future topics will range from access to higher learning institutions for students of color, to the flaws in the biomedical funding system that most research universities currently use, to ways to modernize the social sciences as disciplines. Our next forum, scheduled for Thursday, November 20, will feature Javi Moriam, Professor of Human Values and Ethics at the University of Tennessee, who will speak on ethics in the biomedical sciences and biomedical research. I wish personally to thank the Provost Forum's organizing committee for their ongoing effort and expertise in planning and arranging both this year and last, and the several campus entities that have joined my office to co-sponsor this event, the Gifford Center for Population Studies, the Temporary Migration Cluster, the UC Davis School of Law, the Center for Regional Change, and the Community and Regional Development Program. Our moderator, Philip Martin, UC Davis Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics, editor of Migration News and Rural Migration News, and chair of the UC Comparative Immigration Integration Program. And last but not least, our great thanks to Professor Teitelbaum for speaking with us today. Now Professor Martin will introduce our speaker. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank everybody for being here uh, this afternoon to really deal with a fundamental question, and that question is, is the U.S. losing its competitive edge in science and engineering talent, right? We, we are not the world's uh, great manufacturing power like we once were. We still will do a lot of manufacturing, but our share of the world's manufacturing has gone down. There's a lot of fears that the U.S share of global talent, whatever it is, especially however we measure that, especially in science and engineering, has gone, uh, uh, has slipped. What, we, what we're going to hear today is we're going to hear from someone who's been involved in supporting the funding of science and engineering students and faculty and research projects. Michael Teitelbaum is actually a demographer who taught demography at both Princeton and at Oxford 
and then moved uh, to Washington and did some work on migration policy, directed a select committee that dealt with migration in the late 1970s. I knew Michael in the 1980s when we were both testifying on immigration bills, some of which became uh, part of the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. And then in 1990, you know, we created the so-called H-1B program while we revised our permanent immigration system. And Michael, by that time, had moved to the Sloan Foundation in New York City, uh, and he was funding a series of programs that not just supported young, promising young researchers, but that tried to shape and reshape, in some ways, science education. For example, uh, Michael played a key role in creating the Professional Science Master's Program, uh, which is at 140 universities, including we have one such program here, where students learn science at a graduate level, but also learn something about how to work in a business organization. So it's not just a pure science degree as for research, it's also trying to prepare people for employment outside of universities. He also played a key role in creating and supporting the National Postdocs Association. As you know, as he told me, we really don't know how many postdocs we have in the United States. It's somewhere between 50 and 100,000, but that shows you something about the state of the art and doing the counts. But we do know that postdocs tend to be very smart young people who many times are trying to get more training so that they can land that academic job that many of them want. So what Michael has done and what he will explain in, in, in his book is he's taken a look at how, it's, this isn't the first time that the US has been concerned about a shortage of science and engineering workers. And we can learn something about today's debate by looking at the debates in the past. How is it that the United States has several times faced cries of not enough science and engineering workers? We're going to lose uh, uh, our stature in the world. How did we respond? And then most importantly, what are the long-term implications of being alarmed about lack of science and engineering workers, responding with a lot of government money, and then finding that some of the people can't get jobs after they have gone through and made the big investment. What does that all add up to? Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it to Michael, and he's going to answer those questions as to how that process worked. And I want to thank Michael and all of you for being here this afternoon. Well, thank you, Prabhas. Thank you, uh, Professor Martin. It's really a pleasure to be back at UC Davis. It's one of my favorite uh, campuses to visit. I've been here now, I don't know, four or five times. And most times I've been here, I've managed somehow, not knowing the schedule, to arrive on the day of the farmer's market, which I managed to do yesterday, not remembering that, is it always on Thursdays or, 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 or Wednesdays? Yeah. Uh, so we went to the farmer's market last night. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do on a, on a campus. It's just a very fun kind of experience and very gemütlich in in its feel for the community. So it's really a pleasure to be back in Davis. And um, I, I just want to add to what Professor Martin said, that when I first went to run this congressional committee uh, in the House in the 19, late 1970s, I didn't know anything about international migration. I'm a demographer. Demographers of the day thought it was a trivial factor in demographic change. We all said that. It's, we have to, in fact, I said that to my staff when they proposed we do a report on international migration, I said, well, I'm sure it's interesting, fascinating even to some of you, but we have to focus on the important demographic variables, and this is a trivial one. There's a dead silence around the table. And then one nice thing about demography is if you're ignorant and wrong, and I was, somebody can show you some data, and you say, oh, I was wrong we should do a report on international migration, which, which we did. So that's really, that was my um, baptism of fire into international migration. What I'm talking about today is, do you all know what STEM means? The acronym STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics. 
created apparently in 2001 by the Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation, reframing a previous acronym of unknown origin that was same letters, but it was pronounced SMET. <laughs> and she said, you know, that doesn't sound really good. Why don't we just shift the letters a bit and this will sound really important and formative and you know the rock solid underneath the canopy of all the fields and so on. So that's where STEM came from. And then immigration, and there's a lot of controversy. Uh, uh, this is based on, I put up the cover of this book that I recently published called Falling Behind uh, Boom Bust and the Global Race for Scientific Talent, and this talk is drawn from that. Okay, so there are influential voices saying the U.S. is falling behind, has fallen behind, whatever tense you want to put on it. And I guess the most influential is our president who said that it's in danger of falling behind and called for another Sputnik kind of response. But you see here this, this report from the Business Roundtable. It was 15 employer organizations, some of the biggest in the country, uh, National Association of Manufacturers, the Business Roundtable is the CEOs of the biggest companies and so on. And they expressed deep concern about whether the U.S. could maintain its lead. And then this is probably the most politically uh, uh, influential National Academies report in a long time, rising above the gathering storm. If you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. Um, and you can see what it said. It was an unusual report, and I'll, I can tell you how unusual it was in many ways, but not now because I won't get to the substance of, of the talk if I do. Here are the reports, the covers. This, I like this one especially because the, the business roundtable, there's the business roundtable and the other uh, business organizations that supported this. They put their goal right on the cover. That's unusual to put your goal on the cover of your report. It says double the number of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics graduates by 2015 published in 2005. So they were saying 100% increase in the number of graduates in 10 years. It's 2014, it hasn't happened. But, and, and they have a website will tell you, that will tell you the terrible consequences of it not having happened. This is the Rising Above the Gathering Storm cover. Now these concerns, as Phil alluded to, Phil Martin alluded to, are not new. There have been a recurrent sequence of uh, alarms about uh, a shortage of scientists and engineers, the U.S. falling behind its competitors, going back at least to World War II. I didn't go back any further. I thought that was long enough. And anyway, before World War II, the U.S. was not ahead. It was behind Germany and the U.K. in science and in other technical fields. Um, the first round, uh, here's, the, here's the cycle. You get the alarm sounded. Eventually, maybe quickly, maybe slowly, the government responds to fill the need, given the shortage of scientists and engineers, with additional scientists and engineers, either through education uh, subsidies or through visas, uh, and uh, sometimes by more research money, which will finance more students as graduate students and so on. And then enthusiasm wanes somewhere in there, maybe 10 years after the alarm has been sounded and the response has taken place. And within 15 years of the beginning of the cycle, there's a bust. And we've been through five rounds of these. There's the post-World War II to 57 bust, uh, alarm boom bust, the Cold War, basically driving it. And it was primarily for physics, support of physics. Round two, uh, some of you uh, on the faculty may remember round two, the launching of a small satellite by the USSR into space called Sputnik 1, caused a panicked reaction on the part, it's the only way I can describe it, a panicky reaction on the part of the American political and media elite with uh, conclusions that the US had fallen way behind the Russians in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. The response was very quick to this one, partly because Lyndon Johnson was in was the Senate Majority Leader and led the charge for a massive response to this. It produced within six months, I think, or maybe eight months, a totally new federal agency called NASA. 
the passage of a long stalemated piece of legislation that came to be called the National Defense Education Act that for 15 or 20 years heavily subsidized education in science in, in the STEM fields. And uh, the NSF budget uh, sharply increased over this period. I, may show, I think I have a graph showing you the budget going up. All the expenditures in the federal government went up very sharply. And NASA then started something called the Apollo program, which was based on a challenge from uh, President Kennedy to a joint session of Congress. You should read his speech. It's a really good speech calling upon the entire country to gird up their loins and land a man on the moon within the decade and return him, it said him, him safely to Earth. That was the challenge. And he said he knew it would be a tremendous expenditure of wealth and of human capital or intellectual resources, but it would take that to succeed. And if we were going to do it in a half-hearted way, his recommendation was don't do it at all. All in or nothing, basically, was the call. And he got all in, a huge expenditure of federal money. Well, the problem, the bust occurred after the success of the moon landing program in 1969. All of a sudden, people were less enthusiastic about spending huge amounts of money on doing this. They'd done it, right? The challenge had been met. And the budgets of NASA plummeted very sharply, and there was a huge bust that followed the boom in the 1960s. Round three was the uh, DOD buildup under the Reagan administration. Many of you will remember that one. Uh, there was also a report by the uh, Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education, called A Nation at Risk, that said a rising tide of mediocrity was overwhelming the capacity of the U.S. to compete. You, you, I mean, you can make up the language yourself, but they were pretty good at rhetoric in this language. I, I thought a rising tide of mediocrity was a pretty good, pretty good phrase. Um, and there were the National Science Foundation, the PRA was a small office in the National Science Foundation called the Policy Research and Analysis Office. They produced projections showing that the US would have a major shortfall of scientists and engineers within the following 15 years. And they actually calculated a shortfall number, 675,000 scientists and engineers would be the shortage by 2006. I think. So there were those things going on. There was a big bust in the 90s, uh, shortly after they came out with their shortfall reports. Big mistake, if you're going to make these long-term projections, you should make sure they're so far out in the future that you'll be dead <laughs> by the time somebody can look back. They, they said by you know, it was clear by 1992 that the projections were going the wrong direction compared to what actually happened. So uh, that was very embarrassing. Round four, you notice it's post-Cold War. So the first three were Cold War alarm boom bust cycles. The fourth was not Cold War. It was the simultaneous booms in, in the internet, IT, telecom, and biotech. A lot of it in this state, not here, but in Silicon Valley. Um, Huge amounts of venture capital and, and uh, Wall Street capital going into companies that never made a profit, but whose stock prices went sharply up. And there was a big, big boom and a lot of um, demand for engineers and scientists. And then a simultaneous bust starting around 2001 with mass layoffs and lots of companies closing down, lots taken over cheaply, lots of venture capital loss, lots of stock market value lost, a recession, et cetera. But just before that happened, the number of visas, the H-1B visas, uh, the temporary visas for largely technical personnel, the number had been tripled by the Congress under pressure from IT companies, especially Microsoft uh, and Intel, who were lobbying very hard, saying they couldn't find the workers they needed. So what I'm trying to tell you is you've heard the story before that you're hearing now you may not have heard it, but it's been heard in the country before. And in many cases, it hasn't worked out the way the, the people sounding the alarm have said. Round five is a different one. It was a doubling of the budget of the National Institutes of Health within a five-year period. It went from $13.6 billion budget to $27.2 billion budget in five years, all a matter of political coalitions forming to support biomedical research. NIH leadership was skeptical, 
but it, about that pace of increase in their budget, they were a little worried. But it's hard to say no if the Congress says we're going to double your budget in five years. What do you say? Well, we can't use the money, Senator. You know, so they tried to absorb it. And then at the end of the doubling, the budget went flat. And it's been pretty much flat ever since. And there's a terrible bust underway now among young biomedical PhDs and postdocs who can't find positions. So another cycle. OK, wh where are we now? We may be in round six. We don't know. We'll find out in 10 years or so. We can look back and say, were we in round six when we, when we met at UC Davis, or did something else happen? You never know in, in prospect. There are a lot of ways to fall behind. Uh, I'm sorry I'm turning around, but there's no monitor here, so I, uh, I'm not sure what you're seeing unless I turn around. Uh, you can fall behind in education if you have a weak K-12 system, which many people think the US has. You can fall behind by not producing enough science and engineering graduates. You can fall behind in basic research or applied research. Or you can fall behind in these workforce shortages that stop your, your dynamic, innovative companies from competing on a global basis. OK, let's talk about education. I think you all know, you all know this, right? That STEM shortages are, due, are, are real and, and threatening. And they are due to the failing K-12 math and science education system in the United States and to declining interest among students in these fields, perplexing declines in interest among students. And the common solutions proposed are, well, fix the K-12 science and math system. Everybody, I think, is in favor of that. Encourage many more people to major in STEM fields and import STEM workers from countries that have a surplus. They've been producing a lot of them, more than they need domestically. Import them into the US to fill the gap temporarily while you fix the K-12 and undergraduate education systems. It's the conventional view. There's not really much debate about it. I would bet that most of you believe that rendition that I just gave you, because that's really all you see in the media. And you get it from. I, I listed some of the, the Rising Above report. That's what it says. You hear it from political leaders, and it's bipartisan, like nothing else in Washington. This is a bipartisan view in Washington. It's not a Republican or Democratic view. Interest groups that savagely fight each other and everything else, they agree on this. And the mainstream media, naturally, just follow what everybody is saying because they're not experts on the subject, and everybody is saying this is true. Okay. so. What do we know? Well, the evidence is K-12 education, science, and math in the US is that the US is an average performer nationally among the OECD countries. Some would say it's middling if they're British, and some might even say it's mediocre if they want to be negative about it. But it's in the middle somewhere, maybe the lower middle. The problem we have with these comparisons, these league tables, uh, is that the U.S. education K-12 system is very unequal. It's got a very high variance in its performance. For a lot of reasons we can't go into here, but I think it's self-evidently true. So what you have is large numbers of um, K-12 U.S. kids who perform very well on science and math, and you have large numbers who perform very badly in science and math. And if you average them out, you're going to get a lower average than a country that doesn't have that very large group that's performing very badly. The top tier kids do very well in the international comparisons. The bottom tier kids do very poorly. Now, there is a, a disconnect now, at this point, between the arguments about the science and engineering workforce because only about 5%, or you could argue somewhat more, of the workforce are scientists and engineers. Almost all of them are coming from the upper tiers of K-12 graduates. And those tiers are doing very well. So there's a kind of disconnect in saying the average is low, or medium, middle, middling. And therefore, that's why we have a shortage of scientists and engineers, because they're all coming from the upper tiers. Do, shall we do interruptions? Uh, how do you do this here? I'm happy to do it. No, 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 OK, if you don't mind. OK, so I just put in some caveats here that 
if you know the PISA studies, you know that there's a league table, the top 10 performing countries, and the league table includes three municipalities that are not countries. Um, Shanghai, Macau, and Hong Kong. It doesn't include China. China is not one of the countries, but there are three Chinese cities that rank very well. Singapore is in there. It's a, if you've been there, it's a city. It has 100 acres of agricultural land, I think, in, in the country of Singapore. So it's a 5.4 million population city state. So these countries are uh, odd. It's an odd list. Liechtenstein has 37,000 people in it. And Estonia is one of the top 10. It has 1.3 million. But there are still large countries that are in top 10 PISA ranks. And I show them here, Japan, South Korea, Poland, and Canada are in the top 10. So it's not only the, uh, the oddity of using cities and calling them countries or city-states. It's there, there are obviously multiple things going on here. But looking at the top 10 of the league table is going to deceive you if you think those are countries. There's also a lot of dissonance between elite opinion versus the evidence. I put up here a long quote from the New York Times editorial board in December 2013. Can you all read it? Yes? So I won't read it to you. So when I read that, I thought, well, they must be reading different ACT studies than I have read because in the condition of STEM 2013 from the ACT, you can't read the prose here, but I copied it in the next slide. The first key finding was interest in STEM is high. And I thought, what? How can that? This is ACT, right? We're talking about the same organization, the testing company, they say almost half of the students have an interest in STEM majors or occupations. And I could not explain that. So I just found out the answer uh, this week. I got in touch with ACT with some difficulty, got in touch with the head of research at ACT, sent him these two citations and said, can you explain this to me? I don't understand it. And he said, oh, yes, we're aware of this problem and sent me on to one of his staff who explained what happened, which was their first study, the first study they did had a very narrow definition of what it meant to be a student interested in STEM. And that's where the 90%, they did have a publication that said that, which is what the New York Times was quoting. And then they discovered that they, they didn't know much about STEM at that point. They did this thing. And then they discovered they had probably not done it the right way. So they set, to, set together a team to develop a much better metric of STEM interest. And that's where the second quote came from. And they try to ignore the first publication as being embarrassing for them because they know it's inconsistent. I, I think I'm going to write to them and say they might want to put a withdrawal notice on the, on the website. Because you can go to the website and find the first, the first study if you want to. So it's not that the New York Times editorial writers made it up at all. It's just that they only looked at one of the studies. And maybe they liked the finding. It was consistent with their opinion, so they quoted it. Uh, but the subsequent studies have shown it's about a half. And here's another example. The one reason I was so puzzled is that this is the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA, a sister campus of this one. And they've done percent entering freshman intending STEM major surveys for a long time. It goes back to 1995. And you see it's been pretty constant at about a third. And it's risen, they report. I, I didn't get the axis right there on the graph, but it's risen in the last few years. But it's not 10%. That's clear. OK. So it wasn't consistent. And this is their, their data f about uh, different race and ethnicity categories. And again, you don't see any major declines in any of these subcategories. So does this mean K to 12 science and math is OK? I would say absolutely not. It is far from where it should be. It has lots of problems. 
And it's true, as I said, that the upper tiers are doing well, but it's also true that the lower tiers are doing very badly. And in my view, every kid now in this century needs to be competent in science and math. If they're not, they're going to be out of it as far as their career in almost any field is concerned. It's a basic requirement to be an educated person. A high school education should include competency in science, math, and understanding of technology or they're going to be in trouble. And it's also required to be an informed citizen. You just pick up the newspaper and if you don't know what a politician is claiming and what a, st what a, what a percentage means, you're going to be in trouble interpreting what he or she is trying to say. So I think it's an important challenge and a critical one in many ways, but it's not causing a science and engineering shortage. Okay, how about the U.S. falling behind in basic research? Well, it's not. The U.S. is the predominant actor in basic research. Uh, the previous leaders, like Germany and the U.K., were devastated by the war. And, but the U.S. also had some very smart policies it adopted in the post-war period, uh, which facilitated its rise to predominant, a predominant role in the world in basic research. Probably the most important were decisions that followed the advice of this um, rather uh, interesting title for a government report, Science, the Endless Frontier. Vannevar Bush was President Roosevelt's chief advisor on science and engineering. He led the wartime technology and science efforts out of the White House. And he was asked to write a report by President Roosevelt about what about science in the post-war period in 1944. Then President Roosevelt died. Before the report was finished, he pr finished the report and uh, delivered it to President Truman. And it had a number of recommendations that turned out to be critically important to the rise to predominance of US basic research. The first was a pretty simple one, but it hadn't happened before that. The federal government should provide ample uh, funding for basic research. It hadn't really done that before. Basic research was being financed by philanthropies, charities, associations that raised money for cancer research or whatever. Federal government should get in the game. He said, the companies are not going to do it. I started a company. The companies are not going to do basic research. But more importantly, perhaps, was not just the money, which was critically important, but that the funding should not go into setting up government research labs that would do basic research, which was the model used in France and, and, and many European countries. But instead, the government should uh, enact authorities for government agencies to make grants to universities to do research. It sounds familiar now. But in 1945, there were no, almost no such grants available from federal sources. That was a critical recommendation. It led to the creation of the National Science Foundation, that recommendation. And uh, federal funding has been large ever since. This is not a small amount of money. Whatever people in science may think about the scarcity of funds, it's a very large amount of money, as I indicated in the doubling numbers for NIH. And it's larger as a percentage of GDP or any other way you want to measure it than any other large country in the world. And indeed, the US is still predominant in basic research by any measure you want to come up with. And it's getting stronger. It's not weakening. It's getting stronger. What is happening, though, is that others are rising faster from a low base. And so the gap of leadership is closing. But it's not that the U.S. has not fallen behind. It is not weakening. It's just that others are catching up to what the U.S. did earlier, decades earlier. But there are problems in this basic research system. And I think they're structural problems. And that's really what the book is largely about. In higher education, such as this university, uh, but all research universities, all of these universities are experiencing a system that has positive feedback built into it, a destabilizing kind of pro uh, system in which the more you do of something, the more you need to do going forward. 
So if you get more research dollars from the federal government, you double the budget of NIH, that produces more PhDs and postdocs that in effect hires them. The universities get the money to hire more research assistants as postdocs and as PhD students. And um, that's a positive feedback because they are aspiring to become researchers and get faculty positions and submit research proposals to NIH. So there are more proposals that'll be produced if that system keeps running with that positive feedback loop. I put some numbers up here, which may not surprise you, but may surprise you. National Science Foundation, which is well known for its excellent uh, graduate research fellowship program, a splendid program of really outstanding young scientists, that's 2,000 awards per year. 86% of the 44,000 graduate students that NSF finances are financed as research assistants under research grant funding, not under the fellowship funding. And NIH is 78%. So you have an odd system in which uh, the drivers of demand are basically how much money is available for research, which stimulates demand for research assist assistants who are graduate students and postdocs, but there's not much of a connection between how much demand there is after they finish their PhD and their postdoc. The demand is internal to the universities and to the NIH and NSF funding streams with these positive feedback loops. Meanwhile, prospective students and postdocs don't get very much career information. I haven't checked the website of UC Davis. Maybe I should do that. Uh, but the question is, if you were thinking of going for a PhD at UC Davis in any science field, how much could you find out about how graduates of PhD programs at UC Davis, how are they doing five, 10 years later? Can you find that out from the departments? Can you find it out from the graduate school? I don't know. Most universities don't provide that information. If you go to the website of the law school, same campus, or the business school if it has one, or the medical school if it has one, you'll find information about how the graduates are doing in mid-career but not in the arts and sciences side, and certainly not on the PhD science side. So the students don't have any clear evidence of how, what their prospects might be if they get a PhD from a research university. And what they aspire to do is what they love, which is science or math or engineering, uh, and they would love to be following in the footsteps of their mentor professor and, and become a faculty member at UC Davis and write research proposals and do interesting research and do wonderful, exciting things like that, they may not have a realistic idea, though, of how likely that kind of outcome is. And unfortunately, if you look at the postdoc population, as Dr. Martin said, we don't know how many there are even, but the best, the best estimates are that on the order of 15% of the current pool of postdocs can aspire to tenure-track academic positions. There aren't that many tenure-track academic positions, not likely to grow that much, and there's a large pool, as you can see, of postdocs. So it's especially problematic in biomedical fields. It has something to do with the amount of money that goes into research funding, which goes into graduate education in biomedical fields. I'm going to skip over this prescient demographer's view, but this was Nathan Kiefitz writing in 1983 saying the system we have is not stable. It's going to overproduce inevitably. This is a more recent study from MIT, two engineers from MIT and one from uh, Virginia Tech doing a kind of net reproduction rate of PhDs in engineering, calculating a reproduction rate and saying it's way too high in engineering PhDs. That sort of surprised me because there aren't that many PhDs produced in engineering, but they're saying it's 7.8 per career of an engineering professor. So isn't there also negative feedback, which is stabilizing, as those of you who are engineers know. You want negative feedback in a system or it probably will go off the rails. And the answer is yes, there are negative feedback loops. You can make things unattractive for domestic students and they will stop going into these fields. That's a negative feedback loop. 
And the talented U.S. students who are talented in these fields, they do have options. They can go to business school, they can go to medical school if they can get in, they can, they can go to Wall Street right out of an undergraduate degree and create financial derivatives that bring the economy down, you know. They can do lots of things with who are, if they're very quantitative and very talented people, and they have those options. So the domestic system, if you imagined it hypothetically to be closed, would adjust. The current system would deter a large fraction of those who might otherwise have wanted to go into these fields. They, the departments couldn't grow their uh, RA, their research assistant population as rapidly, or their postdoc population. They'd have to hire people rather than use students and postdocs to be their bench researchers. And the system would equilibrate. Might not be pleasant, but it would equilibrate. And some of the fraction of really talented students who now go into these fields would go into other fields. But the system is not closed. It's in, it, it obviously not closed. Increasingly, it's a global system of recruitment of graduate students in these fields and of postdocs. So the best guess from the lousy data we have about postdocs is that about 60% of them are postdocs who got their PhDs outside of the US and have come to the US universities as postdocs with PhDs from other countries. So the system is clearly not closed if you can have over half of your population or half of your population coming uh, internationally. And it's due to this unplanned intersection between visa policies and funding rules of the funding agencies. So on the visa side, there are no limits on students and postdocs. You can, a university can, doesn't have to worry about there not being enough visas. They can get any number of visas if they have the money to finance these people. Um, and on the funding side, if the, funny, if the research money is robustly arriving, so to speak, they can finance the international postdocs and international doctoral students using federal government research money, even though they can't use federal government fellowship money to finance those students. That's only for U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents, but for research funding, they're treated as employees and they can hire them to work in the labs as research assistants. So that, that's a weird system that nobody planned in which the bulk of the graduate students and postdocs are supported by research grant funding from the federal agencies, and there's no limit on the number of international people who can be financed that way, which means the system, to put it simply, is not closed. It's a globalized kind of system. There are other sources of instability. There's positive feedback in the research side as well. So if you have more research money available, what, what do you get? You get more research proposals being produced because there's more money available. The success rate goes up. People say, oh, I have a better chance. I'm going to submit a proposal. And I'll show you some data quickly on that. And the incentives for research universities, which the provost may experience himself, I don't know, are basically to favor expansion uh, using research funding to expand the faculty, to expand the research activities, to expand the, the the graduate programs uh, to become a higher ranked, a more prestigious institution uh, using what has to be described, I think, as soft money. It's not core money of the institution. It has to be generated from research grants. So that's a, a problem uh, of incentives for research institutions who are being offered the ability to become better do better research and expand using federal research money, which turns out not only to go up, but also to flatten out and to go down, leaving the university sometimes overexposed, having built labs in anticipation of more research money, and then the budget goes down, and all of a sudden the research money does not appear. There's one study by David Korn, who was at Harvard until recently, on the NIH system in which they determined that uh, for the biomedical research system, the national research system, to be stable, it needed a 6% annual increase in the NIH research budget. If it went below 6%, the system went into a, an unstable crisis situation. They, did, they didn't even try 
to figure out what would happen if it was 0%. They tried 4% and it was unstable. So they stopped there, but it did go to 0%. And it really went to negative in real terms. You also have incompatible time frames. I'll be quick on this. Basic research is very long term, intrinsically so. And federal funding appropriations are annual. So you can get these accelerations and decelerations unpredictably, depending on what else is going on in the political system and in the economy. Here's the NIH budget from 1960 to 2012. You see, this is the, the uh, current dollars, meaning you know unadjusted for inflation. You see it was a pretty steady, substantial, ultimately substantial increase from essentially zero in 1960, or very close to zero, one million or so, up to here, 10 or 15 billion. This is one billion, I said that wrong. Um, and um, this is the doubling period with a bracket around it. You see it went sharply up. And then it went up a little bit, then it went down. And here are, the, here are, two, indicate, here are two measures of inflation-adjusted funding. And you can see this one comes sharply down from 2003 when the doubling ended. And that's the, the crisis in biomedical research funding that some of you may be experiencing and others of you have heard about. There is a real crisis in biomedical research funding. Uh, resulting from this erratic pattern and this very dramatic increase followed by a dramatic decline in real dollars. And here's the consequence of this kind of thing. The green graph here is the success rate of research proposals uh, submitted to NIH from 1962 to 2013. You can see that those of you who were around and submitting proposals in 1962 had a 55% success rate with your submissions. It was very nice to have a one in two would, would succeed. And it's been coming down pretty erratically ever since. Here's the doubling period here. You see it went up a little bit there, got up to 30%. The concern about one of the reasons for the doubling was because it got down to 25% or so, or 20, maybe even lower, 22% here. That was considered way too low and damaging. They doubled the budget, and then after the doubling, it went down again, and now it's below 20%. This is not a favorable trajectory, and you can see what's driving it. The number of funded grants has not gone up. These bars have not gone up that much. The number of proposals has, with some ups and downs, gone up very substantially. This is the NSF budget, which I won't, uh, for reasons of time, won't go into. But you can see, again, you get a big increase post Sputnik. Then it's flat for a long time. This is constant dollars adjusted for inflation. Then it goes up very substantially. And then you get the most recent period of very erratic budgets. This is very hard for the provost to deal with. I don't know if you suffer any of the consequences of this, but it's very hard for academic institutions to deal with these erratic accelerations and decelerations of external funding. And here's the same graph for NSF. You can see roughly the same pattern. Declining success rates, rising numbers of proposals, pretty flat, little increase in the number of grants funded. So you've got a highly productive funding system. It leads the world. And yet, these booms and busts cause all sorts of harms. You've got, if research funds rise and then they flatten or fall, students, some of you may be graduate students here, um, may find their prospects for a career in the field they're studying in wane while they're still in training. Because it takes five, six, seven years to get a PhD and then a postdoc in some many fields is required. By the time you finish your training, the prospects that looked pretty good when you started may have turned around and they're in a bust phase and you just happened to graduate or finish in the wrong year. Research faculty, including highly productive research faculty, may see their careers disrupted, their research programs disrupted by failure to get a renewal grant because everything went south for reasons beyond their control. Universities face these risks of having leveraged up, I already mentioned this, on soft funding for salaries 
medical schools are the main problem here in which a lot of the uh, faculty salaries are dependent on soft money, which may not be forthcoming. And um, they've also expanded their PhD student population and their postdoc population as the workforce for their laboratory research. So they face financial crises if the budget growth that they anticipated in their projections lags behind what they anticipated. And the risks are highest in biomedical fields. So if UC Davis didn't have a medical school, you'd probably be less vulnerable to this than you do have a medical school, so you are more vulnerable. This is just a quick image of an article I wrote uh, in Science Magazine about biomedical research in which I said I hoped I would be wrong uh, in saying what I thought could happen if the budgets didn't turn upward again. And I'm sorry to say that I wasn't wrong. They didn't turn upward again with one aberration that I'll mention if you want me to, but basically they've not turned up. And unfortunately, a lot of the consequences turned out to be correct, which makes me sad because I think it's very destructive to the research enterprise. Now, what about shortages? I already mentioned this, I'll, sk I'll skip over this. When it comes to STEM occupations, as distinct from STEM fields of education, there's no agreed definition. The National Science Board wrote this in their annual report. There's no agreed definition of STEM occupations. So I can come up with my own STEM occupations, and some researchers do. The National Science Foundation says it's about 5% of the workforce, or about 8 million people. And they require a bachelor's degree to be considered a, uh, a STEM worker and a STEM occupation. If you look only at degrees, rather than occupations, it's about 11% of the degrees are in these fields. So you can see immediately there are more people earning degrees than there are occupations. Uh, this, this recent report coming out of uh, Brookings Institution redefined STEM in its own way, said it's 20% of the occupations in the, or jobs in the country, or 26 million people in 2011. They did that by counting as STEM occupations fields like uh, auto mechanics and carpenters and electricians who use calculations in their work and they're skilled. I, I'm, I'm uh, paying a carpenter right now as we speak a lot of money to work on my house in Connecticut and I couldn't do what he does. He's very talented, he's very skilled, but I wouldn't call him a STEM worker. And he does, cal he he does a lot of calculations as well. But anyway, the general point is with a range like that from 5% to 20%, keep that in mind, of the workforce. Those are the ranges that people talk about. It's no wonder there's a lot of confusion. I'll skip over this. And I'm gonna focus on science and engineering occupations here. So natural sciences, engineering, social and behavioral sciences. This is the National Science Foundation definition. It's a critical part of the workforce of any modern economy, probably the leading edge of dynamism in all modern economies. A critical part of the workforce, but it's small. They say it's 5%, maybe it's 6% or 7%, but it's not 20%, and it's not 30%. And everybody who's looked, who doesn't already know the answer, shall we say, when they start to look, who's looked for evidence of general shortages has not been able to find them in the evidence. If there were shortages, we'd expect rising relative real wages for these occupations. We don't find that. They're flat or declining relative to other professions. We expect faster than average employment growth. We do find that in some STEM occupations and don't in others. So you can say yes and no in that category. And we would expect low and declining unemployment rates compared to other high-skilled occupations, not to the whole workforce, which is not highly educated. And we don't find that either. So you have these general shortage claims. I believe they, them to be misleading. I've already said nobody has found any empirical evidence of these. What we do find is across science and engineering fields, a lot of variation. So you can't talk about STEM occupations, you can talk about biomedical research, or you can talk about 
systems engineering, or you can talk about petroleum engineering, and they each have their own particularities. Some of them are very robust and dynamic, and some of them are in the doldrums at any one time. The other thing is they change over time. So if you look at these three engineering fields, I know there's some engineers here, you will, you will remember that some of these fields of engineering were very, very much in demand and then very much out of demand, depending on what was happening in the market. So petroleum engineering has gone from the, the backwater of engineering, the worst possible field in engineering to go into, the lowest paid, the fewest jobs, to the highest paid, the most jobs, hiring bonuses, all in the space of about 25 years. What happened? The price of oil changed, and new technologies allowed extraction at higher prices now of oil in uh, the US and, and Canada, and all of a sudden there's a big boom. Across geography, you'll find these local hothouses, one of them down the road here in Silicon Valley, or in Boston, or DC Metro, or Research Triangle, Austin. These places have booms and busts that are local, high frequency, high amplitude. And in Silicon Valley, um, those of you who, I know some of you live in Berkeley because I've talked to you, that's not quite Silicon Valley, but it's in the same general housing market. Housing costs are the highest in the nation. They're four times the median housing costs. I don't know what they are in Davis metro area. Probably not four times the national median, but probably higher than the national median. So these, are, these, these hothouses are atypical. You shouldn't really draw any national generalizations from what's going on in these hothouses. I'm going to skip over this. This is just a graph of the professional science master's degrees that were mentioned earlier. And you can see how they've expanded from nothing in 1997 to 300. It's actually 320 now in 2014. And these are degrees that are very much in demand uh, among employers. The, the students graduating with these degrees seem to get multiple job offers from everybody I've talked to. And they're sort of surprised by that because their PhD students graduating are not getting multiple job offers. Now this is an argument from Kenneth Arrow, famous economist, Nobel laureate economist, and his uh, Stanford colleague, uh, William Capron, who basically said what people are really saying often about these shortages are actually, what they really mean is there's not enough demand for scientists and engineers. Read the quote and you'll see what they're saying. So the claim could, could be a confusion of supply and demand in the minds of people claiming shortages. That is, they're saying there really should be more jobs for scientists and engineers. Why isn't somebody paying for those? Federal government, companies, whatever. I'm going to skip over that. I just want to show you this graph, which I think is quite interesting. The engineering. You, you hear about first degrees in uh, the U.S. being low as a percentage of total degrees, and they are, 16% in natural sciences and engineering. Compare that to China, 44% of first degrees are in natural sciences and engineering. And you see these other countries like South Korea and Taiwan and Japan also much higher than the U.S. The U.K. is pretty close to the U.S. But the big driver of this natural science and engineering is engineering. 31% of the first degrees in China are in engineering. 4% of first degrees in the US are in engineering. So it's not really natural science and engineering that has got this huge disparity. It's engineering that has the huge disparity. If you subtract these two, you'll see that the natural sciences side, is, they're pretty similar. OK, there is evidence that US markets do respond if there are shortages. I mentioned the petroleum engineering one. Computer science uh, has these demand-driven booms and busts. We have a couple of computer science faculty here, and they will attest to how erratic 
the industry is. And you can, um, the government can succeed in, in aborting these market responses by generating booms in supply uh, of one kind or another and driving people away from going into these fields. So here's a, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but computer science is one of the core fields of the uh, STEM shortage claims. And here are some leading computer scientists saying, is it a tsunami or a sea change? How are we going to respond to the explosion of student interest in computer science? Which doesn't sound very similar to what the New York Times editorial said about interest of students. I don't know what's happening at Davis. I'll bet you there's a big increase in enrollments and interest in computer science. Here they're just showing a bunch of universities and what's happening uh, in course enrollments. They use terms like exploding, which I don't like. This is not an explosion, but it's a rapid increase. And demand for the computer science major is increasing. And you see here's the real curve, this very erratic curve, but they're showing a central tendency, if you will, of rising demand, but very erratic booms and busts. So the puzzle, the shortage claims prevail despite the evidence. We can't find very good evidence of general shortages. Why is that? Well, I think the main reason is uh, that the claims are being made expensively and professionally by employers largely in the IT sector. They're spending a lot of money to make these claims. The immigration bar is also very active in urging that there are shortages for reasons that are probably obvious to you. There's some support in higher education and government, but not much. And then the non-specialist media don't know the subject. How can they? They're non-specialist. And they pick up the expensive PR campaigns from the employers and just repeat them. So it's like an echo chamber. And why are they doing that? Because they're smart. Why are the companies doing that? because they know that it will work politically. They know that they can convince the political system that there's a shortage of scientists and engineers, and that will lead them to agree to increase the number of visas, which is what they're really looking for. That's their goal, but the most compelling claim is to say there's a shortage uh, that will hold back the industry and hold back economic growth. Meanwhile, there are people who question this, I'm one of them, but there are others as well, many others. They're mostly easy to ignore. They're academic researchers like you. Easy to ignore, right? All of us. Rand people have written this many times. Easy to ignore. Um, what about the science and engineering societies? Yes, well, they are concerned about this, some of them. And if they disagree with the claims, they're really not organized to counter the high-powered, high-finance kinds of campaigns that, are, that have been underway now for really 15, 20 years. Some of them are actually internally conflicted about it and therefore can't come up with a kind of common view. But whatever their views are, they're poorly funded and they're balkanized. There are 50 some uh, biomedical field research societies. There are 27 engineering societies of any size. So there, there's no common perspective that you might get in medicine from the American Medical Association or in law from the American Bar Association. So I would say the result is it's no, no contest in legal terms. The shortage claims prevail and they will continue to prevail. There's really not a, uh, a level playing field here. The proponents of shortages are much better organized, much more committed and much more well-financed than the people who are doing research and not finding evidence of what they're claiming. So where are we now? Well, we're maybe, you notice the question marks, maybe we're midpoint in a sixth round of alarm boom bust. We don't know that. I don't know that. There is very strong pressure on the U.S. government to address the claimed shortages. They could do it in two ways. They could increase funds for universities, for science and engineering education, K to 12, right up through postdocs, 
or they could increase money for research funding, which would flow into the way the system is structured, would flow into funding for graduate students and postdocs and increase numbers. But there are these problems like the budget and the, um, the uh, constraints on raising the budget and other demands on the budget. So they're not doing that. Or they could increase the number of visas, which doesn't have any budget limits, doesn't cost the federal government anything to increase the number of, budget, of, uh, of visas. And there they can find support from these lobbying coalitions on the left and right, but they will also run into public opposition. So they're not sure what to do about it. The goal of the IT lobbyists is basically to expand this temporary visa program called the H-1B. I won't describe it in the interest of time, but we can talk about it if you want to. So one possibility is that since the Congress has failed to agree on comprehensive immigration reform, the Senate bill that was passed, but not by the House, that President Obama will take what he calls executive action to respond to the needs of the economy and of the, uh, of the public by uh, using the powers of the presidency to increase the number of visas, both on the family side and on the employment side, and particularly the science and engineering visas. The president could probably find some legal argument that he has the authority to increase the number of science and engineering visas. And um, there's also urging for more students to major in science and engineering coming from different parts of the government and elsewhere. If this were to stimulate, if these actions were taken uh, and it stimulated a boom in supply of scientists and engineers, would there then be a bust as the previous rounds? I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We can't anticipate whether the demand would rise in sync with the supply or not, as it has not in the past. So I say, stay tuned. We'll find out in 10 years or so. Meanwhile, biomedical leaders are not waiting. Biomedical research leaders, they're doing, they're trying to understand their system, which is probably the most vulnerable. And this is a report to the director of the National Institutes of Health about the biomedical workforce. <coughs> and this is just the, the uh, cover of an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. You see the title. You can see that there's alarm about the system having fundamental flaws in it and how can we rescue it. And this, this is by a group that some call the Gang of Four and others call the Quartet. But Bruce Alberts was the president of the National Academy of Sciences. Mark Kirshner is a very prominent Harvard uh, systems biology leader. Shirley Tillman uh, was president of Princeton until a year or so ago and a very prominent biomedical research leader. And Harold Varmus is the former director of the National Institutes of Health and now the director of the National Cancer Institute. So this is a pretty high-powered group of people in a high-powered journal saying, friends, we have a problem. We need to deal with it. Last slide some possible stabilizers for an unstable system. Well, I've already said what I think needs to be done about K-12. to I won't belabor that point. For graduate education, I think it would be desirable for us to think about how to align graduate education better with career prospects, less with the amount of money for research. I think it would be good if we could be more transparent about career outcomes of recent graduate students and what they're doing, not they went to a good postdoc, because that doesn't tell you very much. But what are they doing after their postdoc? How are they doing in their career? Uh, and it would be good to clarify the goals of these visa and funding programs, which have, don't seem to be very well coordinated or logical. For research institutions, it would be good to diminish the incentives they are being presented with to leverage up on soft money. Right now, we're telling them, if you borrow money and build buildings, um, we'll, we'll finance it essentially out of research grant funding on the indirect costs, and that's not a good incentive for those institutions. But also, because this 
system is causing a lot of these problems, it would be nice to create some countercyclical factors in the system. For example, what you might call flywheels to stabilize the system. And uh, one thought, the interesting one, is a small additional overhead on research grants that would go into the provost's budget as a sinking fund that he could use for bridge funding for faculty who have been successful grant recipients and suddenly find themselves not renewed or their proposals not accepted. Right now, the provosts are finding the money from internal funds to bridge some of these gaps in funding, but that's not healthy for the institutions. And since it's the system that's causing these problems, the system really could provide some stabilizers to this. For federal R&D budgets, which are the source of many of the problems, if we could achieve growth but steadier growth, convince the members of Congress who run these committees that it's not a good idea to double the budget and then stop. It'd be better to have a slower rate of increase but keep it going in a predictable way. That would be healthier for research, healthier for the institutions, and healthier for the federal government. But there's still people who are calling for doubling of the NSF budget, who's saying that it's fallen behind NIH. They got their budget doubled. Why didn't NSF get its budget doubled? So I say here, be careful what you wish for. And finally, it would be highly desirable to have more objective data and research on this critical system. We still are in the dark about how many postdocs there are. We don't really know what's going on in these institutions. We know they're suffering, and probably we could hear from the provost how much the suffering is, but it can be very considerable, and a lot of research faculty and postdocs and graduate students are suffering, suffering as well. So that's where I want to stop, and uh, there's time for discussion. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes for questions, and then we can continue our discussion outside. But let's get right started. Yes. Um, so I'm going to give a. I'm a physicist, so I'm going to give a physics perspective. And I seems like throughout your talk there was one thread where you seemed to assume it was a bad thing if not all grad students and postdocs had academic careers. Um, I don't agree with that. I think it's actually really healthy, first of all, to have competition for the academic jobs. And in the case of physics, unemployment is tiny for people with physics degrees, even right through the recession. So people go off and do all kinds of great things. So it seems like a, seems like a great system. So, so I'm curious if you see it differently from other points in other fields, or if, I mean, so I wonder if some of the crises you mentioned would not seem like a crisis to me at all. Um, well, I, as I said, biomedical research is the one that's really in crisis right now. Physics is a small field compared to biomedical research. It had a crisis in the 90s, and it had a crisis in the, um, in the uh, well, it almost had a crisis in the 50s when DOD and DOE started pulling out all the funding that they had put in to physics. So it's had crises, but not now, because it didn't really grow. It didn't expand the way biomedical research funding you expanded. About the soft money. Yeah, soft money is. Are you here? Are you at UC yeah. Davis? Okay, so our tenured faculty in physics at UC Davis, do they have a guaranteed salary? Uh, nine month salary. Nine month salary, okay. In medical schools, tenured faculty don't have a right. guaranteed so salary. Right. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. not healthy. Yeah. Yeah. What the institutions are saying to them pretty explicitly, but more generally NIH is saying, but not explicitly, is you can fund your faculty salaries, your nine-month faculty right. salaries, yeah. not entirely, but maybe largely yeah. on soft money funding. And if the soft money doesn't keep growing, well, that's, the crisis, that's the crisis. The crisis, But that's the biggest field of science, right. no, so by okay, far. So I think physics is relatively OK. okay. But, but then, then the other thing is this rising or fit, falling grant um, success rate. Yeah. I mean, we see that, for example, I know it in astronomy and astrophysics, where the soft money positions are actually small, 
part of that. And it seems, I almost wonder in that, that case how much of it has to do with word processors and people. Oh, that's a, that, that, that is an issue. Um, also, how, how many people are really good people are not funded is a sort of separate. And that's a hard thing to measure. Yeah. That's a hard, I mean, the, the funding agencies say we have, these are all recommended for funding and we're able to fund 18% of them or something like that. That's the claim they make. But maybe some of them, uh, almost certainly well, some of them are not as good. Hmm. Looking at this for astronomy and astrophysics. Astronomy and astrophysics uh, are unusual, as I understand. It's your field, not mine. But they, it's the only field of science I know of in which they can agree on what the highest priority uh, projects are. No other field of science has the capability of agreeing on it. That's a, but it means there's some coherence to the field and people know what's really important. There's a consens more of a consensus. There's less of a consensus in many of these fields. Yes, sir. There's something I would like to understand your analysis. Can you go back to your slide number 13, I believe? Uh, well, I'll try. It's, a, it's actually, it's about K to 12. Oh, okay. That you, so in your analysis. Oops, there. Right. So, so this is saying that K to 12 is not to be blamed on, on the possible shortage. Yeah. I understand because there's enough upper tier students that are, that are doing just great. Uh, fine. Okay. So maybe that that's not a, a an issue. But I wonder how you enter in your analysis gender because there's another claim out there about the lack of women in science, right? I mean, no, it's absolutely. Not going Absolutely true, except in biomedical. Yeah, and not only mm -hmm. gender, but also race. Yeah. Because, you know, as you know, in California, there's yeah. a lot of Latinos, and yeah. that, that population is growing really fast. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it might be very well that right now, so that, you see, that could become a crisis there, because, for example, in California, now 52%, as I understand, of kids in K-12 are, are in that, those schools. If they are not going to science, then domestic students are not going to go to science in large numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least they're not going to receive the basic competencies that you mentioned. So I wonder well, the, you play that into your well, the basic competencies, I think all of those kids need to, need to learn, no matter what they go into, uh, including carpentry, by the way, because, or auto techs. They, they should understand technology. To do, that doesn't make them STEM workers, but it, it's important that they understand the technology. But to deal with underrepresented groups in different fields, which vary across fields, it's not the, the, the appropriate way to deal with that, in my view, is not to say there's a shortage of people in this field in general. We need to have more people going, that you should have focused programs on those underrepresented groups. What are the barriers for those groups that cause them not to go into these fields in the same percentage as the normal, the non-under, I don't know what to call a non-underrepresented group, a, a normally represented group. What, is, what are the barriers? In fact, we were discussing this earlier today about um, what's the evidence about why women um, in computer science, the numbers have been going down, and in mathematics, and, and, but not in biological sciences. I think each of, each of these fields has its own peculiarities. I don't know what happens in astrophysics and physics. I'll bet you there aren't a huge number of women in your programs, but I could be wrong. It's, the pro progress is embarrassingly slow. Pro pro progress is what? Embarrassingly, embarrassingly slow. slow. Yeah. yeah. So you need to focus, I think, on the yeah, particular. Exactly. Uh huh. So, when you talk so you've about got this. You've got momentum. System. Yeah. yeah so you've, you've got this momentum built into the system. But there are some interesting. I know. If I'm familiar. I, I didn't deal with this subject in the book. So, yeah. Uh, but there are some interesting initiatives that seem to have positive effects uh, in the with with these populations, and I think they ought to be. I mean, a follow-up question is: So let's assume that yes, there's no shortage on the upper levels, and we don't need more PhDs, more. Fine. But if we accept the fact that everybody in the you know, average population is going to need some basic training on math and science competency, how about teachers? Teachers, Where yeah. Where are teachers going to come from yeah. if they don't take a STEM major, right? For example, 10 miles from here, 
there are high schools where the, there are no math teachers. The yeah. teacher is teaching math. That's the only option. Yeah. And so have you considered that into your calculation? I mean, there's a lot of claims about the number of teachers going into well, they Not enough teachers for science and mathematics. I think that's probably true. Uh, part of the problem there, it depends on the state and the local rules, but in many jurisdictions, it's not lawful to pay higher wages to teachers in some fields as compared to other fields. So if you can imagine UC Davis paying its faculty the same wages irrespective of the field they're in based maybe on the, their age, say, that would be one way to be objective about it. You would have a, if you're 43, your salary is X or Y, whether you're a computer scientist or an English literature person or um, creative arts, you would be paid the same salary. That's what happens in K to 12 in many parts of the country, although there are some places that are experimenting with supplemental pay for low, poorly provisioned fields, if you will, like science and math. Yes, it's a problem. We're going to do two more questions, okay. one here and then Kim, and then we'll break and we'll talk in this. Okay. Hi, coming from the biomedical sciences, um, I've noticed that uh, just getting grants approved is very difficult, but for the R01, for NIH's R01, it's yeah. almost, there's a certain ridiculousness. There's certain what? Ridiculousness in it now because basically, when, when we submit a grant, we're submitting for some future work we want to do, but that work is pretty much done yeah. in the grant, you know, right? That's what biomedical researchers tell me. You're not, I hear that from all of them. We, we already have the results because they require preliminary data that be presented as part of the proposal to make it a credible proposal with these very low success rates. And so we do the research, and then we submit the proposal uh, to fund the research, or part of it at least, that we've already done. That's a perverse outcome of a system with very low success rates. So do you agree that, since you're in biomedical field, do you, do you agree that there is a problem? In yeah, I definitely do. I'm actually in the law school now. So you're in the law school, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I don't know what it's like for the other uh, branches, um, but I mean, you said physics, you, you haven't been affected, right? Well, it depends on how you, part of it is a different it's perspective on the same facts. But we, we don't have all these soft points. The, the thing, the crisis, and I totally understand that piece, we don't have in physics, where somehow there's been this shooting up of money, it's all dumped into soft money, and labs have been built and all that. We have some balance, you know, there's some balance of soft money, it's more or less sustained. There's a little people feeling the squeeze, the little bit of squeeze being felt right now is because of economic issues. But overall, there's a pretty solid it's a pretty, actually the report that the uh, NIH group did that I put the screen up on, they compared biomedical fields to chemistry. And they showed that chemistry, which is pretty close to biomedical fields in many ways, is much more solidly based, much more stable. It doesn't really have a serious crisis. So you can't generalize that there's a crisis right through science. But they didn't pick physics. They could have picked physics, but I think they thought chemistry was closer to but, biology. But we even debated within ourselves that whether all graduate students should get academic jobs. And yeah, well, there's different they're not going to. Yeah. And they should know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, Kim, last. So um, my question has to do with um, sort of trying to bring in um, measuring outputs. Um, and if we can measure outputs, then we can those be brought in your argument that we need sort of equalizing or calibrating mechanisms, right? So in biomedical fields, the, the um, postdoc soft money has proliferated postdoctoral positions. Postdocs are really cheap labor that we, in many ways, as a country, have, have relied on to get a lot of, to make a lot of innovation. Yep. Right? We have expanding knowledge in, in biomedical fields, and that's been done on the backs of this really low paid. Um, and so we have structured a labor market, a training system, and a labor market, and a whole market for routes and all the stuff that really depends on that low-paid, highly skilled, highly educated labor force. So we've created 
that. And I think some of the, the um, cross-field comparisons that you have mentioned, biomedical to chemistry, there, there are differences in that training trajectory. Um, Absolutely. Post-acts are not nearly as huge. Of course, the funding mechanisms aren't that's quite the same for chemistry. So we've created these, yes. these markets. Well, yes, I agree with that, except nobody planned it. It was not a conscious creation. It was more like um, putting a very large and well-funded system in place with incentives built in and then letting it run without uh, adjusting its incentives as things changed in the system. So if you can imagine um, the Federal Reserve Board uh, didn't exist. So there was, it was the Congress who would have to adjust the interest rate uh, or the amount of bonds being issued by the federal government. That would be more like this system in science. NIH doesn't really control the system. NSF doesn't control the system. It's a system, complex neurosystem without a brain. So to speak. I don't mean that the people are stupid, I just mean it doesn't have a central control mechanism. It's running on inflows and outflows with system dynamics put in place 30 or 40 years ago. And it, it was okay as long as the budgets kept rising because it was structured for growth. When the budgets flattened out or started declining in real dollars, the system went into crisis because it doesn't have stabilizing mechanisms built into it. So that's why I was talking about stabilizers. Look for stabilizers to inject into the structure of this system to keep it from going off the rails if the budgets are not going to be stably rising over the long term. You have another question up there? Well, I think we I think we have a break, but we'll have time at the reception. Let me take a moment to thank Michael uh, and thank all the people. reception, we have brains, and we do have a reception <laughs> as well outside, uh, and Michael will be here, and please join us for a few minutes uh, outside. Thank you again.